Mr. Jason Valentin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much, man. I appreciate uh, you having me on here. Yeah, it's like full circle. One, you don't look any older. But when I told you, I was like, I lived actually in a bedroom of yours for not, I mean, that sounds terrible. I, You have a rental property. I lived in a, in a bunk bed with my best friend when I was 19 years old. So I definitely look a lot older than I did then. But you probably look younger, I think, actually, <laughs> than you did then if that's a compliment. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, maybe I'm uh, more in shape now than, than I was back then. So, you know, trying to trying to stay young as I grow old. Yeah, which is just, it's wild. It's been 12 years since then. And this is before I was married. I've been married 11, 11 years now. And for the context of, at the time I was going to Bethel School of Ministry, people that haven't seen a Bill Johnson message or a, your de- father, Chris Valentin's message, most of the internet or Christian has seen that at some point or been inf- influenced by it. If not, maybe the music that they literally listen to on the Christian radio stations that they listen to every single day, that's something. And at the time you were speaking at the school And I remember just hearing you're probably the only person that really focused on and no knock to anyone else, really the in-depth personal side of like, hey, hard stuff happens, bad (laughs) things happen, hard, you go through hard things. And like, how do you actually reconcile that? A lot of everything else was education and encountering God. But that was something that always stood out to me. You're the first person I ever heard say, how does your heart feel? Like, I think that was the exact words that you use or something <laughs> like that. And even at the time, I really feel like I was so blind in my ambition that I was kind of like, how does my heart feel? What does that do to move this lever or needle? And as I just got older and, and went through more things and got punched in the mouth a little bit more by just bigger giants, I really started recognizing those things. So I want to read these things to you, actually, to start this off. Uh, so maybe this might just turn into a coaching session where you just like <laughs> coach me the entire time. Uh, but I wrote down three things that I'm struggling with uh, to show you how I've been checking with my heart. Uh, one, I constantly feel like I'm not doing enough, even though I logically know that Jesus is the worthy sacrifice, that when God looks at me, he sees Jesus. I still feel like I don't read enough, pray, declare enough, and, and like just put enough effort in that every time when I come to the Father, I still feel like, whoa, first I need to like read for an hour, pray in tongues for an hour, do this thing for an hour. And I still constantly feel that. I'm hard on myself because I'm actually afraid of people telling me no or rejecting Mm. me. So I often reject myself first and I'm really hard on myself and disqualify myself so that the only option for others is actually to give me encouragement um, because they're already like, man, you're already so hard on yourself. So every speaking engagement I've done, I've gotten off stage and I've said that was terrible (laughs) just because I'm so afraid of the feedback. So I just go really hard and negative on myself so that no one gives it. And the last one is I have a fear that God's going to pull out the rug, uh, that my desires that I have, that at some point God's going to make me fail to humble me. So it makes me scared to try to do big things because I'm just scared that at some point he's just going to want to be like, nope, even though you're doing all the right things, boom, I want to want to humble you. Um, those are three things that came up me for me just this week. And so I just want to say thank you to you for your talks at, at Bethel. And yeah, I just want to tell you that first and then I have some questions for you, but just want to share with that. Man, thank you so much. I mean, yeah, listen, we could dive into all that stuff if you want. And the, I think the truth is, is those are things that probably 99% of men feel, right? Is I'm not doing enough, even even though I'm doing above and beyond my actual capacity. Um, even what I do, I'm not, pr- I'm not fully proud of, or is it enough? So I'm not doing enough. And even when I do it, is it really enough? And, you know, am I, do I have what it takes? I think thanks to John Eldridge, right? We all know that the question that every man's asking himself is, do I have what it takes? And that, that's a, that's a big question. That That's a, that's a demon that all of us fight. And the truth is, is, is that you have to fight it at multiple levels. You have to win that battle at multiple levels because we continually grow and we don't stay at the same spot all the time. And so, you know, when you're 19 and you're hustling and you get a couple of breakthroughs, you feel really good. Right. And you answer that question like, oh yeah, I've got it, man. And then you meet a woman and you get married and, and. And then you go through that insecurity of like, man, do I really have what it takes to be a husband? And you answer that question at that level, right? And and it takes a while. And as you grow older, you have kids and you start a business and then you feel like you're going to fail because you're extended and you're pushing. And so everything, you start to feel insecure and you're grinding. And, and then business, you know, for a lot of people, it becomes, okay, I can do it. And so one side of that's really natural, right? It's, it's part of growing and continually growing is putting yourself right on the edge of your comfort zone because there really is is no growth in the comfort zone and there's not a lot of comfort in the growth zone. And so we're, we're pressed up against those two worlds. And so I would say that 
man, they're things that all of us face. They're not things that we all have to get beat down with all the time, though. And uh, and again, I, I mean, we could talk a long time about this stuff, but I do think for all the men that are watching this, one of a man's greatest fears is that he's going to be a poser, that he is that that he's going to find out that he not isn't who he really says that he is, which is part of why. If you remember when Jesus, before he went into ministry, before he did anything besides turn water into wine for his mom, which that's a lesson in all of itself. Like you should do whatever your mom asks you, whether you're ready to or not. But before Jesus turns water into wine, uh, or sorry, before Jesus goes into ministry, a really profound thing happens to him is he gets baptized by John the Baptist. And when he comes out of the water, Father God comes out of heaven and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, this is a pivotal thing, right? This is so pivotal because when he comes out of the water, Jesus hasn't done any crazy miracles. He hasn't gone and extended himself. He hasn't done all these crazy works and and put in all this effort into building this massive ministry. And he hasn't even started on his mission yet. And God goes, you're the man. I love you. You don't have to do anything else to prove who you are. And then he goes from that spot into the wilderness where he's been fasting for 40 days and the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tested by the enemy. And what's the devil test him with? Well, he basically has this showdown and the devil says, hey, if you are who you say that you are, throw yourself off of this a building and let the angels catch you. If you are who you say that you are, turn these stones into bread, right? And the whole time, the devil's saying, you have to perform. You have to prove it. You wow. have to try to earn it. And the devil tells him like, the devil says, if you serve me, if you worship me, I'll give you all this stuff. And again, what is what is the battle over? The battle is over identity. The battle is over identity. Jesus, are you who you really say? that you are. Now, Jesus defeats the the enemy, not by going and turning stones into bread and not by jumping off, but he says, I don't have to prove it. I already know who I am. I don't have to earn it from you. I don't have to prove that I am who I say that I am. And it says that Jesus left the wilderness in the power of the spirit. He left there more powerful than when he had come in. And I say all that to say like, no, this is the battle that every man faces. The battle that every man faces is the battle of identity. Are you who God really says that you are. And that's going to get tested on multiple levels at multiple times. And so the fact that you're being tested, that's not a bad thing. Jesus got tested in it. What it's designed to do is it's designed to bring us into a greater place of knowing and power and wholeness and health that we can rest in who God has called us to be, which is sons of God. Now, out of that identity, we do produce and we do perform, not for love, but from love, because it says that we are we are Christ's workmanship put on this earth to do good works. And so, you know, all of us have a mission and all of us have uh, an assignment on this planet. And so if you aren't producing and you aren't performing from a place of love, you won't feel like you have a lot of purpose in this life. But we don't we don't do it so that we're valuable. We do it because of how he made us. So anyways, welcome to uh, the same boat as all of us are in. (laughs) Yeah, and I love what you talked about just shedding the perspective, reading through that. It's like, Jesus was baptized, Holy Spirit came upon him. This is my son who I'm well pleased. You said he got that identity, but the identity was tested. And I think everyone has that, but I loved how it was an actual test because I thought we look at wilderness as it, as if it's so easy to recognize. Like if God put us into a wilderness, picked us up, threw us in one, and some like dark demon thing came talk to us, then we'd be like ready for the test, right? We're like, oh, this is that time, but not like e- every single day right? Like in this daily process of, okay, I think this is something that I'm being tested in. And one of the last things that you talked about was that the, he said, I'll give you everything, which is basically like, I'll shortcut where you yeah. don't have to be, I'm going to shortcut it for you, but just do it this way, which could be again, doing something negative for a positive result. I just, I, I just listened to a story about this of a guy that, you know, he wants to give money away to people, but then he sells bad products and services to try to make money so that he could give more money away. It's like, you're doing something negative to create a positive result. And I could see that that is something that, I mean, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross, right? He wouldn't have had to sweat blood. Like he knew what was in front of him if he didn't try to get rich quick of what he was being tempted by and how often do we go through that? And so just kind of mapping that out in three phases like you just did is gave me clarity as well, as well as like, I really can defeat that test with what the word of God actually says because he overcame that test and it didn't say like Jesus then next week also got tested to see if he would turn a rock into bread again, maybe a different test but it wasn't the same thing. And a lot of the guys, they literally struggle with the same thing their entire life. But with the word he was tempted and also with the word 
he defeated and you said he walked in a greater power afterwards, like almost defeated something that now he like moved on to obviously probably harder things. But what's your thoughts on that? Because I think a lot yeah. of guys think I'm going to struggle with this forever. This temptation, yeah. what is that? How do you see that working? Well, let me just say that one of the easiest ways to beat it, to defeat it is to remember why you're doing something. And so I remember when I first started speaking, um, I came on staff when I was 24 years old uh, to Bethel Church, became a pastor and started speaking. I'm sharing the pulpit with really great men. You know, I share the pulpit with Bill Johnson and Danny Silk and Dan Fraley and my dad. And these guys are men who, you know, are are very profound in the Christian world. And so it's, it's quite intimidating to get up and speak from the same pulpit you know, because you're being measured and you're being tested, whether you want to or not, it's just human nature, right? People are listening to me talk and they're going, do I like him? Do I not like him? And they're measuring me according to every other speaker that takes that platform, which is okay. Again, it's not an evil thing. The, the challenge is when I start to measure myself against who I think that I should be, right? And so I remember when I was 24, I, I spoke a couple of times and I'd get off stage and I'd ask myself this question, how did I do? And I, 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 really, I really wanted to do a good job, but I'd always leave insecure because again, Again, my measurement was unrealistic. I'm going, did I do as good as my dad? Did I do as good as Bill? Do I do as good as Danny? And the, the truthful answer is no. And I remember one time I got off stage and I started asking myself, like, how did I do? How was that? And right away, the Lord corrected me. And he said, he said, you're asking the wrong question. He told me, I don't want you to get up here and preach so that you do a good job. I want you to get up here and preach so that you change people. And, and when you get up on stage, your job isn't to preach good. Your job is to change people. And honest to God, this is the, like I know it sounds really Christian. That is what happened to me. That's what changed me. So instead of getting up and trying to perform really well so that I would get accolades, which is human nature, it's not even evil. It's just human nature, right? I started to reshift my focus and go, why am I getting up here? I'm getting up here to change the one person, which what that does is it co connects me to my passion. And when I'm connected to my passion, I actually perform better because I believe in what I'm talking about. I, I, I feel passion. I'm convinced in why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm in right alignment. And that really changed everything for me. It's a better measurement than am I a good man? Am I a good speaker? Am I a good teacher? Am I a good businessman? The better measurement is am I doing what I'm called to do? And so, you know, am I a faithful servant? That's how I would say for you even and all, you know, the rest of us guys is like, don't go, am I the best businessman ever? Am I, do I have what it takes? Am I pleasing? Am I worthy of affirmation and respect? No, the better question is, am I doing this for the right reason? Can I look at God and say, I am your servant who's willing to lay it all on the line every time I come to work, every time I come to my family, every time I come to my wife. I'm not the best husband in the world, but I hope I'm the best version of me today. I hope I'm the best servant today. I hope I'm, I hope that I can and put my full effort in and being okay that that's enough because everything else besides that is the poser, is our ego. Everything else besides that is just me trying to do something so that I feel worthy of love. Again, that's the temptation. That's the temptation, but that's my ego talking. That's my inflated wow. ego. I need to reframe that and go, am I doing the best with what I have been given? Because that's the measure that Christ is going to measure. And that's something that I actually can control. I can't control if I talk better than you. I can't control if I'm more profound than my dad or more profound than Bill. That's not even what I'm up here for. What I'm up here for is to give the, what I've been given away. Can I give that away? So good, man. You you talked about some powerful men that you've been around. And I, I look at even the people I get to interview, travel to. Usually when I travel to them and we get to sit in person, I get to see how they are before and after the interview. And I usually, like part of my personality is I weigh those things. So if they do something with excellence, I kind of try it on mentally for myself and I go, okay, if I go home and, and I did that, oh, they work out at 5 a.m. I'm like, okay, let me see. Put that on in my head and I go, should I try that on? Is that an attribute that I would love to have more of? And I kind of look through that lens and I've noticed like some certain commonalities of a lot of them, but there's also this this term that says don't get to know your heroes because mm. then they're not your heroes. And and that's that's always a very thing a big thing in business because people want to seem like they're very important. So they they be looked at maybe this is in the pastor world too so at, to some extent they don't say hi to any of the 
congregation. They just get off the back of the stage and people think they're so amazing, but if they just saw that they bleed red and had the same issues, then they wouldn't like them as much. And yeah. common in Hollywood and it's big in business, like don't get to know your clients, you get too, too close to them. And I've never, never liked that. But for you, you being around Bill, your, your, your father, Danny, and not them specifically, but these are guys that are doing a great job that are men. What are the attributes that you've seen that's a commonality and overlap with all of them that makes they've accomplished a lot and they're well known? And so whatever that means, like yeah. I look at that like someone who's ran a four minute mile. I'm like, you're just a person, but man, that is really cool that you've been able to do that. What has been the thing, the mentality, the the plan? So or from all of them, is there a commonality that you've seen or core things that stick out to you from each one of them that you're like, I want to take that on and try that in my life because that's super inspiring or you know, fill in the blank yeah. there? Um, yeah, several things. So their ability to serve is beyond most, most men's current capacity. And I say it like that on purpose because we all we all could grow our capacity but most men uh don't or refuse to because they don't you don't see growth fast enough it's too painful but i've watched bill and my dad and danny the greatest men i know they are the greatest servants they are the guys that when they go home at night their head hits the pillow they're not going to sleep they're refueling they're retooling literally like my dad will read his bible at 3 a.m after preaching a two-hour session because he wants to grow and he wants to be able to serve more and i've watched him do that that, uh, you know, contrary to that, that phrase that you said, you know, don't get to know your heroes because you'll get disappointed. It's been the opposite for me with these men specifically is the more I've watched them, the more I've looked behind the scenes, the more I understood how they got to where they're at and why they've sustained it, which to me is important. Um, so my dad's probably the greatest servant that I know in the sense of, you know, he has never, he's never done something just for money. Uh, he's constantly grinding and working hard because he's on mission. That's just what he feels called to do. And he just doesn't change the subject. And so I think, I do think the other piece to it is these guys are willing to endure more pain than most men. And it's really hard, as you know, to build something. It's not easy. A lot of guys sit back and they criticize from the couch and whatever. You know what I would do if I was leading that ministry or that business or, but it's hard to day in and day out to push and to not change the subject and to get constant feedback and to take risks. And these guys do, they just do. They're, they're willing to do that over and over and over again. And so, you know, I think for me, like those two things really dictate your level of growth, because if you're willing to serve and you're willing to go through hell and not change a subject when it gets hard, then what can you not do? I think the last piece that I'll add is if you can not do it alone, if you can band together with other men who are greater than you, who are on the same mission, not, not that has the same outcome, you'll go further than you ever could have gone. I think this is most men's downfall. I think a lot of guys can grind for a while. I think a lot of guys can keep on mission, but they don't do it with other men. And the problem is, is that you're only as wise as you, you're, you're only as encouraged as you have encouragement for you, you know? And, and so when you start to add men to your life, you literally get their skill set. you get their favor, you get their breakthrough. And so honestly, that's what I've done over the past three years of my life really is built a network of men that I run with every single week. And wow. it's, it's made all the difference in my life. And I'm like torn between multiple subjects, but I don't want to forget this one. You obviously are pouring into guys and I want to hear like kind of the gap, but also there's this, this like grouping. I have a great, there's new life church in Colorado Springs, very big church. They're a church that's been through so many hard things. And one of their leaders was like, I think, I don't know, they used to like pray at the prayer breakfast for the president or something had a terrible downfall and, and so looking at like this people that have those first two, but like, there's always this weird feeling of like this, I don't want to be that guy that's so blind that, cause I'm like, how could you be so dumb? Right. From this perspective of me, I look at guys that have huge leadership, huge influence, affluence, everything that fall, whether it's sexually or in other ways, you look at it when you're not in the situation, you think how dumb are they? How could they go through that? But then you contemplate it for a second. And you're like, there's no way they were dumb if they built all that stuff like they weren't stupid people so yeah. what what have you learned through when you're around giants like that there they also know giants that have fallen over the years have you gleaned any experience or what do you think that is how can we set up to not have these huge 
falls if we're going to build something like that's been my like common thing recently is just like what what do i need to do to if i do b- build that i don't place myself in this terrible situation that all of us can do so i've been you know my my world is counseling i've been counseling since i was you know almost 20 years old so uh, uh, quite a long time and <clears throat> the thing is 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 most most people have never went back and addressed their foundation. See, the first inheritance that you were supposed to get is an inheritance of identity, an inheritance uh, of security, of love. Uh, and that's where you bond from when you're young. As a, as a child, your dad and your mom were supposed to give you a really strong, healthy foundation of identity, of health. But the challenge is most people, and if we're just talking to men, most men listening to this didn't get that. Most men had to learn to perform for love. Most men uh, had to to learn how to survive because vulnerability wasn't actually safe in their home. It was used against them. <clears throat> and so what happens when you're young is you begin to build these really bad habits to medicate pain because you have to see addiction starts in our life when we can no longer bear being present in your life. That's where addiction starts. And for most people, when you can no longer bear being present in your life is before you can even remember that for a lot of people, home was not a safe, loving, caring place. And so a lot of men, great men that we know have a real broken foundation. And when you have a broken foundation, man, you, you build these really bad habits uh, as you grow up to medicate pain and they never get rid of them. So that's one side of it, right? They, they live with all this hidden stuff. The other side of it is maybe they don't have a bunch of, they may don't have a pornography addiction. Maybe they don't have uh, you know, addiction to a uh, sex addiction, but a, a lot of them never actually learn how to go deep and really bond in a healthy way with other people because they didn't grow up bonding. They have unhealthy uh, attachments. And so they never feel known, seen, loved, cared for, understood. So it doesn't matter how much power they acquire. They never actually feel known, seen, loved, cared for, understood. Human connection. And human beings are wired for connection. So if you, as a human, if you are not connected, deeply connected to other people, which means they know me, they see me, they care for me, they love you, then you're living in a a super painful reality. And it's only a matter of time before you have to severely medicate that. And you end up doing things that you never thought that you would do in order to feel bonded, connected, loved, seen and known. And so, you know, a lot of men simply have never opened up before. It feels weak. It feels... Uh, embarrassing, but then you have to go back to who's actually the stronger man, the guy that can admit when he's feeling lonely, the guy that could admit when he's feeling weak, the guy that could, could reach out and ask for help or the guy that can't actually do that. And so, you know, for men, I mean, this is what I spend most of my time doing, helping men actually really get well, get whole uh, before they go and try to conquer the world. It's like, man, we got it. We actually got to get out the old stuff and get in a new operating system of health and wholeness and care and compassion for yourself. Or you'll just try to earn it forever. You'll just try to prove that you're enough. And that just gets so lonely. And, you know, eventually you can only hold out for so long before, you know, stuff breaks. What's interesting about that is a lot of it can be good result wise. So if you're like, yep. you talk about it, it maybe there's the terrible side where it can get to, but even I'm thinking about, I'm going, okay, am I addicted to social media? Because social media could be something that if I'm trying to be present or something like that, right? So I'm thinking about that for myself and I'm like, well, we, but we make so much money and impact so many people through social media. So if I do more and more of that, I can kind of justify it through, but look how much good it does. And I could see that being like a very big hidden one compared to if I'm drinking a fifth of, of whiskey every night. Yeah. I, I could probably figure out that that one's not as good, but there's these other ones that kind of like, imagine in ministry, even if you're like, you want the approval, you're just driving through that fear and you build something amazing, but then you at the end, you're still disconnected. You still don't feel good, but you can build it healthily as well. Uh, there's a quote that says, your mess is your message. For you, I'm assuming you didn't just wake up one day and be like, I really think men need this. So like, I should probably teach them this. I'm assuming you had your own kind of epiphany or revelation with this from personal experience, what, what's kind of the core things that you went through that made you make this, uh, now a, a vision or a, a passion that you're relentlessly pursuing, uh, for other people. And I'm assuming you're still doing it for yourself, but was there like, did this impact you before it impacted others? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. So, you know, I was really blessed to grow up in a home with loving parents and, um, but you know, we do, we all have a story And when I was, uh, well, I, I got addicted to masturbation by the time I was 10 years old. And what I didn't know at 10 years old was that I have OCD and that what comes with OCD is tons of anxiety. And so I found masturbation, um, to medicate my anxiety and was unable to put words to that. So completely addicted to that, you know, at, um, at 12 years old, I, uh, I should say this, all of my sexual experiences up until I was 16 years old were with guy friends of mine. And so addicted to, to pornography at 14, watching porn with my guy friends. And, um, the, the best thing in my life was I had a dad that I could go to, to talk about all this stuff and tell him about my masturbation addiction, tell him about the pornography, tell him about the oral sex, tell him about stuff that, that I was ashamed of. And I every single time my dad would help me work through it. He would look at me and say, Hey, this isn't who you are. Let's work through this stuff in your life. And at one point I remember being completely addicted to pornography and masturbation as is 15 years old. And my dad said, Hey, why don't you tell the family? I'd been talking to my dad about it for a year. And he said, Hey, why don't we tell the family? Well, the family is my sisters and my mom. That's it. It's not very popular to go to your sisters and say, Hey, I'm really struggling looking at other women, <laughs> you know? And, but I, so I, but I was desperate. I remember telling my dad, like, do you think it'll work? And he said, yeah, I do. I think it'll help. So I remember sitting down one night and talking to my sisters and my mom, you know, I was crying. I was telling them what I'd been struggling with and they just got around me and they loved me. Right. And they prayed wow. for me and they just said, Hey, this isn't who you are. And so that year, that was my sophomore year of high school. I wore a white t-shirt every single day to remember who I was. And of course I got lots of laughs. People, you know, people thought it was dumb, but that's the year I broke my addiction to pornography and my addiction to masturbation. And, um, I started to realize like my dad t started telling me when I was young, he'd say, son, anything that you overcome, you now have power to break in other people's lives. So that wow. was where, where it really started in my life. And, uh, and then in 2007, I ended up going through a divorce. My wife left me for somebody else and um, she ended up getting pregnant and having a baby with another guy. So I became a single dad of three kids and, and um, I spent three years raising those kids. And again, you know, it, it's not a super, super helpful thing if you're a marriage counselor for your marriage to end, you know, it's not like uh, wow, that really helps my, <laughs> my yeah. credibility, but you know, I don't get to decide what happens to me. I just get to decide what I do with it. And so, you know, I've, I've been through so much. I've been through a nervous breakdown, lost use of my arms for a year, you know, massive depression, massive anxiety. Um, again, not understanding I had OCD and how, how to help it and, and how to overcome that. Um, so my life has just been a myriad, like everyone's life, really, like who hasn't been through a ton of stuff. Um, but I had great community. I had great family. And so being able to not hide my story, but weaponize my story. And that's what I tell men today is we have to weaponize our stories. We have to quit letting shame tell us what we can and can't wow. share. Quit letting shame uh, hide us and make us feel small. But if you weaponize your story, if you begin to share your story, if you begin to, to use it as a tool to get other people free, man, it's crazy how much freedom that not only brings to yourself, but that brings to everyone else because honestly, all of us have, are in the same boat. Maybe your story is not exactly mine, but you've been through stuff that you wish you hadn't that, man, that you need to get, not just get over, but become powerful over and overcome and give away as a way to set other people free. So that's originally where I first started to go like, man, I gotta, I have to give away what I've been given. I had great parents who told me that was my job. Jay, your job is to help people overcome the stuff that they're stuck in. Literally, that's what my dad would tell me when I was young. That's so good, man. And what's crazy is I talk about mess to message. I There was a, this concept that we've seen even with our guys. One, a lot of times, like in the business sense is where God showed me this because I was so afraid. I started a fitness business, but I was 60 pounds overweight before. That's awesome. And so I lost the weight, but I actually thought that I had to hide that part. So I was like, why would anyone want to listen to me if I was the guy that was overweight? I lost it, but like, but I had problems with it. 
And so I kind of hid that and it really, nothing really happened, but it was the only thing I knew how to do. So I thought if I'm going to sell something, I probably should sell something I've done. And then finally I had this like breakdown moment where I went to an event and I just told people that I was fat and I told them why I was fat. And it was crazy because I cried the whole time. Like I'd never, my wife had never seen me cry. And this is like four years in a marriage. Never seen me cry. Couldn't finish the talk. She had to help me. It was so embarrassing. And I thought I didn't serve these people at all. And then pretty much everyone bought all of our stuff. Yeah. And I was like, I don't get it. Like there was other fitness people. I didn't even do anything, but they really felt like they could connect with my story. But even bigger for me actually was that like, when I told my story, I realized that not everyone just ran for the hills, like your sisters and your mom. I was like, this is so interesting. I thought everyone was going to like leave and reject me, right? That's what, if they really know who I am, they'll never love me. They'll always reject me. They'll leave me. And so we did this practice with all the guys. When I started the first men's group, we just started the call with what's something that no one knows about you. And it, luckily someone started it with that. They were molested as a kid. Yeah, I was going to say that I stole super glue from the flea market and I fell on it and it blew up in my pants <laughs> and it was like not very profound and no one would have been open and vulnerable, but he did that. And it just like went to the next guy. He did heroin. He was in jail for five years and we didn't know. And like, he never told anyone cause he thought no one would buy anything from his dog training company. So all these things, but man, it was something so powerful around. I said it. So like I put it out there, I like just released it like you did with your dad at first, but then it took more. And then it was like, none of everyone liked them more. That was what's crazy yeah. is they knew them more. And it goes back to like what Danny Silk, no one ever knows Danny Silk that I talk to. So I'm never gets to quote him. But like Danny talks about how you can't really love something or someone more unless you get to know them better. Yeah. So it's like, you have to have commitment in a relationship to work through things. But when you work through things, you get to know each other better. And, and then you can fall deeper in love when there's this like connection. And man, everyone like everyone liked everyone more. And that's what you experience as well with your, with your family, but then also with your story. Like when you are able to like release that, there's this weird haunting that like, have you noticed this with your guys that if people knew who they were, what they've been through, then they think that everyone would leave and reject them. Cause there's this fear around saying these things, right? Like yeah. at first, I think also there's a fear and I would love to know your perspective on the fear of greatness as well. Cause I feel like once you start sharing all your crap for lack of a better word, you kind of get it feels comfortable. You start getting more comfortable with it, but then you get afraid of also sharing your ambitions and your dreams as well. And there's like that other side of it. So co just comment on that. Cause you said so many great things, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't remember the first thing that you asked, but I do going back. I think that as men, we are constantly afraid that, you know, that we're not going to be who, who we set out to be. And I think that's the fear of greatness is the fear that I am a poser, the fear that I can only sustain this for so long that eventually the, the shoe's going to drop. You know, Brene Brown gives a really, I think, incredible definition for courage. She says, courage is the ability to share your story with your whole heart, being willing to bear your imperfections. And in, in her study, she says this, the only difference between people who love themselves and people who don't is people who love themselves. Uh, they believe that their story is what makes them beautiful. They believe that their story is what makes them beautiful. And you know, if you grew up in a home where no matter what you did, your parents loved you, cared for you, you know, adored you, then it's not super hard to believe that, wow, oh, I made a mistake, but that makes me an overcomer. I fell down and I got up that, but that makes me better. It's not hard to believe that. But when you grow up in a home where you get the opposite message and you watch social media and they people portray the opposite message. You know, most men's heroes aren't going, hey, here's where I failed. Most men's heroes are saying, I wake up at 530 every morning. I jump in the ice bath. I drink 30 gallons of water. I've got the perfect wife. I've got the perfect bank account. It, it's all it's all BS. And, we, you know, we know it's all BS, but we hold ourselves to the standard. What men can do is they can do the opposite. They can realize that you're not worthy of love because of your performance. We're going all the way back to the beginning. You're worthy of love because of how you were made. You are made in the image of God. Okay. Now, from that place, let's be authentic. Let's be, let's unleash yourself, unshackle yourself, right? There's no one on this planet that, that has become righteous through their own works. There's no one on this planet that doesn't have regret. No one that, that has lived a life worthy uh, of salvation. No one has. Okay. From that place, 
can we all just love ourselves because we were built from a place of love? Can we all just be honest with what we're going through and where we're at? Because that's where the power is. And I used to think the same thing. And then I really started thinking, how many, how many people want a counselor who's never been in their shoes before? Nobody. How yeah. many want a guide, a wilderness guide, who's never gone through hard stuff in the wilderness? I know I don't. I want the wilderness guide who's gone through hell, who almost died, who survived several times, and every time he comes out on top. And honestly, that's what we want in men. We want a businessman that's able to show up and say, hey, I'm still working on my marriage. I got some communication things that I'm working out. It's not super fun, but I'm not giving up. This is what I'm doing to grow this. But my financial side is good over here. But my kids, I'm still working on this. Like That's what men need. We don't yeah. need a bunch of posers running around pretending that's when you get afraid that the shoe's going to drop. When you when you overcome the fear that you aren't who you say that you are is when you start being authentic and you start being vulnerable and you and you start telling and sharing your story with courage, being unwilling to be judged by other people in a way that makes you want to change and hide. So, but that's not an easy thing to do. It starts with a group of men who are more courageous than you who are willing to be the spear point and, and, and willing to go forward so that you can kind of rise up in that uh, through their courage. You talked a lot about groups of men and you have like Bill and your dad who have been good friends for a long time. Those types of relationships are really difficult. I have like a bunch of them that are written down of like relationships that literally cause them to go to completely new dimensions of, of accomplishment, like just impact things that they've done. Uh, I think it was the person who wrote The Hobbit and and narnia like they both were actually best friends for yeah. like 40 50 60 years and they both wrote like two books that are just absolutely insane and then movies right and so their connection made them more even more successful they were able to like build that but it's so difficult i mean if there's anything that's like more difficult than anything it's finding five really really good friends that yeah. when you leave there you didn't become more unhealthy. I can't tell you how many times I've been around people that try to convince me to eat worse, watch more <laughs> junk and not work as hard, you know, or like whatever. And yeah. it's like, I leave there and I go, man, all I did was like want to eat ice cream now because everyone hates on this part of my life. You know, and it's like, I don't want that. I want people that I get around and I go, oh, wow, I really want to, I really want to do better in my life. That I think my question, I have two questions about it. One is like, why men? Like, why not co-ed? I think there's like a lot of people will have co-ed relationships or their wives and them and, and their other couples will hang out. Or why is men specifically important to be around as a man? Masculinity is not something that a man is born with. It's something that's poured into a man through other men. And so there's definitely a place for women in men's life, 100%. But there are certain things that you can only get through a man. It, it, for instance, you know, back 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, a young boy would be initiated into manhood through other men. And nowadays we have so many uninitiated men. They've never been initiated into manhood. Therefore, they never actually feel like a man. And so, you know, my wife's not going to inspire me into uh, greatness the same way that my father's going to inspire me into greatness. She doesn't have the same authority. And, you know, my wife's not going to inspire me to show up and be present at home the same way that my friends are inspiring me to show up and be present because they're doing the same thing. And so, you know, I think when you start to get around men who are dangerous, who are capable, who are confident, who are not hiding, who show up every day, it's inspiring. Science tells us that. There's tons of science around, hey, if you have a goal to lose weight and you partner with somebody else, the chances that your, your chance at success is skyrocket rockets than if you do it yourself. So for me, it's always been, find me, if you show me a group of guys who are unwilling to compromise, un, unwilling to back down, unwilling to to take the easy route it's only a matter of time before their life is successful it's only a matter of time and so to me that's the big deal is like you can't rely on your wife you know my so many men feel like their wife is their mom because they put their wife in that spot they don't wake up on time they don't take initiative they, they don't follow through with what they're going to say they're going to do and it's like well we should quit freaking blaming our wives for being frustrated with us when we don't do that it's not my wife's job to do that. But here's the thing. 
if I get around other men who don't go easy on themselves, I'm not saying who emotionally beat themselves up, but who, who keep the standard high, I will naturally rise to that level. I will become what I hang around because, or I will leave the group completely because it's too painful to stay in the middle. And so I've just found that in my own life, man. I'm, I'm with, I've got a group of men that have raised the standard. And for the last three years, we've ran hard and they know when I'm coming, when I come home and my home is not full of peace, they know that I'm going to show up still. I'm not going to emotionally evacuate my home. I'm not going to check out. I'm going to show up. I'm going to bring peace to chaos. And they know when, you know, when, when I get lonely, I'm not just going to go to porn. I'm actually going to face my loneliness and I'm going to reach out if I need help. You know, these guys know that they can count on me to show up in my own life, not to be perfect, but to hold the standard. And I know they're doing the same thing. And honestly, when I come home and it's tough, and I know that I got my friends out there who are doing the same thing, facing the same things in business, facing the same things at home, facing the same things in a relationship, it honestly makes it easier. It makes it easier to show up because we're all doing this together. So how do you go about creating it or entering into that then? So it's like you have it, but it's, we talked about it's difficult to create or it's not very difficult to, to enter into, but you got to find things that align with you. There's a brotherhood here in Austin that they hold you like you're an infant and a man tries to get you back in your infancy and like hold you and like, and treat you like a little baby to like heal your baby wounds basically. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't really want to go to the, the, the baby cuddle pool. Like it's just not, I don't feel that that's where I connect. So that can be difficult though. There are, you can search brotherhood online. How do you either create or enter in? Like what, what did you do or how could these guys either create or enter into something like that? Yeah. There's lots of different ways. Um, you know, it's honestly, it's why I started Brave Co. So Brave Co is a, uh, we are a men's movement that's, that's built in birth for discipleship. So I actually believe that discipleship is the best pathway forward uh, to becoming who you're called to become. And so, you know, we've got a, a we discipled 500 guys last year um, online and, um, and we have a year long discipleship program. Um, and so I do a lot of it through Brave Co. Um, we also have a 12 week discipleship program. So a lot of groups that a lot of guys that I'm working with right now are in these 12 week discipleship programs. And so it's the foundations of masculinity, masculinity. It's all about what does it mean to be a man, how to work through pain, how to set healthy boundaries, how to show up emotionally. And uh, and so, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff with men where. We do a, a like a long range shooting school, or we do a, 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 some adventures, and then on the heels of that, we jump into a discipleship group together. That's a great way to start. But honestly, it's get. I, I think the mistake that we've made in the church is we've looked at discipleship as let's go to coffee together. You tell me your sins, I'll listen to them, and we'll do that every single week. And honestly, it's just not inspiring. Uh, who wants to do that more than one time? It's not appealing. But um, it's got to be a lifestyle. So these guys that I hang out with, we, we've all done the foundations of masculinity together. Uh, we all do live together every week almost. Uh, we watch UFC fights together. I mean, we just do, we do life. Most of us hunt. So we have a common bond of hunting and fishing. And so, you know, we're raising kids together. It's about being intentional. And to me, that's the big thing. It's like, okay, rally around a hobby. It doesn't matter. To me, what your hobby is, if it's surfing, find a bunch of dudes that like surfing and go surfing, but then take it to the next level and actually go deep, go beyond just, you know, what's up, let's catch a couple of waves. Every once in a while, go deeper, talk about the real stuff in your heart and the real stuff in your life, you know, pull open up and pull another man into some of the issues that you need help with. It's never convenient. That's the thing that honestly, bro, that's the real challenge is most men really struggle with having friends. Because in order to have a real friend, you have to go deep. You have to go deeper than how are you doing? What's going on? You, you know, we, you, you can't just do that, but you, you also, you won't have a real deep relationship unless you're willing to do that. And that just takes time. So let's say people have that friend or someone like that. I think, I think the best thing that you, the best type of friend would be these overlaps, right? They, 
They share these commonalities of what you care about for these guys. Do they have a relationship in Christ that they can push you in that area? And then what's it, what, are, what are these other things that you can do as well? Like, do you guys both like UFC? Well, that's a good way to kind of overlap those two and create that. I think people call it direct and indirect relationship. Right? Like indirect is like, check out my boat. And then it gets you in to build at least yeah. enough of a foundation to be like, you know, how's your relationship? So let's say they have a relationship right now they could think of what's a way to initiate even just like a deep conversation. Cause a lot of them maybe just never have even done it. Like, what do I, what do I say to this person? Do they t talk about something deep with them or do they ask deep questions? I, I think that'd be a, a cool way to kind of wrap it up is just like guys can go out there and just initiate. I want, I want to be more intentional in creating a deeper relationship. What's a way they can either initiate or start that? Yeah, I'll give two ways. Like, for example, I just finished a long range shooting school in Oregon. I had a, a bunch of businessmen, you know, really wealthy dudes come out there and <clears throat> at, the, at the heels of that event, right? We spent the whole time shooting guns, hanging out, talking around a campfire or whatever. We, I send out an email to them. Hey, if you guys want to go deeper, <clears throat> we can jump on. Uh, and do the foundations of masculinity, do 12 weeks together. So many of those guys will jump on and do that course. They don't know each other. They don't know each other except for that weekend. But by the end of those 12 weeks, those guys will be brothers. They will be so deep because they've all shared their story. And so it's honestly, it's one of the reasons why I like a pre prepackaged program like that is because it, it automatically does the work for you. You watch the videos, you talk about it, you go deeper together. Okay, so that's one way that's already done. It's already built. It's prepackaged yep. for you. If you're like, man, I don't want to do uh, some 12 week program, but I want to go go deeper with men, then I would I would say like, build in some kind of commitment with the guys. Like, start something where you where you say like, hey, for the next six weeks, um, like I like maybe you even start by saying I want to be more intentional in my relationship with you. Uh, we've been best friends for a long time, but I want to be more intentional on. I want to grow, you know, and I want to be able to challenge one another. Um, <clears throat> what do you think about whatever going fishing next week? I want to maybe share some of the parts of my story that I haven't told you before. And <clears throat> is that something you'd be interested in? It, guys don't like to do that stuff because it feels embarrassing or it feels risky, but you got to do something like you have to move the needle forward somehow. And I think you got to mature enough to where that kind of stuff's okay. And go like, well, that's a normal part of life is sharing a, a, deeper things about your life that you haven't really shared before. So that's one way to do it. Um, at the shooting school, what we did too, is like at the end of the day, we would talk through what was a failure of yours? You know, what area did you fail in? That's cool. And that's a great question to ask even a businessman. You know, if you have business partners that you have, maybe haven't gone super deep, like do a lunch where you talk about, hey, what's a couple of areas that you feel like you've really failed in recently? But you start the conversation. You be the one that, that steps up and say like, man, actually the place I feel like I'm failing is with my wife. I feel like I haven't done a great job lately. And start with that voice vulnerability. But you know, all of us are facing the same fear. We're all facing the fear that someone's going to get to know us and not like us. And you have to be able to face that in order to really be accepted, to really feel known, to really feel loved. So good, man. For the guys that do want to go through your guys' stuff, what's the best way for them to get connected to Brave Co., the events you guys are doing, 12 week, one year? Yeah. So we just closed the one year program right now. Um, we, and we're just focusing on the 12 week right now. So they can go to braveco.org and we have like, there's literally two tabs. One is small groups. So you can start a small group and invite guys into it. Or if you're like a leader, like a church leader, um, we also do curriculum for churches. And so it's one of the ways that, that we help empower lots of men is our curric Brave Co. curriculums in churches. And so all of our curriculum is pre-recorded content. It's high quality. We spent over $80,000 last year just in filming. So it's not like cheesy stuff. And um, it comes with uh, weekly assignments and some um, like breakout sessions, that, that kind of stuff. Um, we also have a long range uh, shooting school and a pistol school. It's called the Brave Co Experience. We do high ropes course as well in Utah, Alabama. So that's October 4th through the 8th. And again, you can find that on Brave Co's website. So yeah, if they go to braveco.org, they can check us out. You can follow us at braveco.men on um, Instagram. And then of course, we've got a podcast that guys can listen to us. And uh, we talk about how to be a strong, healthy, capable man. So, so good, man. And and one of the things that I think is really big for everyone else is the in, in business side, I always ask people what costs more education or ignorance. Yeah. And it's a trick question. Yet, even in this area of right now, you're 30, 40 or 50. 
and you don't have great relationships, the chance of you having them in the next 10 years are not very good. Like, and, and it's simple with that, even with finance, in, unless something dramatically changes in your skill set, your knowledge, if you're 30, 40, or 50, and you've made no dent in your financial future, the chance of that all of a sudden happening it, with the same amount of time again, it actually just goes down. Yeah. And so looking at something like this, if that's a reality check in this place of relationship and in-depth growth and, and even masculinity and growing into the man that you want to be, I'd highly recommend just going over there and going, does it take time? Yes. Is it going to take money? Yes. But what is the opposite? Just as I talked about, ignorance is very costly in business. You're paying whether you buy that course or you get educated or set up your business right or do your taxes correctly. You're going to pay some way. You either pay for the tax person or you pay more taxes. It's one or the other. Mm -hmm. And so I look at this the same exact way. And I just say that because, man, that that is the most risky thing is that for people not to go check it out, get involved. And at least afterwards, if that's not what you needed was these great men and learning how to be a great man and, and walk in what God calls masculinity and walk it out. If that's not what you need, at least... You tested it out. Now forever, you can walk away and go, Nicholas was so wrong. Jason was so off the mark. And you could say you didn't need it. But what if there's an opportunity that you could go to something like what they have? And what if it was just what you needed? And all it took was a little time and a little money. That's just insane to me. So I appreciate you, man. I, I, I pray Thanks, that these bro. guys get connected to what you're doing. Uh, and thank you for breaking down in the short time I'm going through. You talked about the curriculum in your 12 week. And I was like, crud, we could have done an episode just on those core pillars on some of the takeaways that you have on that. So just a plethora of great knowledge. And thank you for what you and your family uh, and the movement that you've created is doing. Yeah, thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's an honor. I appreciate it, man. Awesome, man. Well, all those links that you just talked about will be down in the description as well as all the ways they connect with you and your personal content as well. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching the video. If you want to join me and other Christian men that are building financial wealth without sacrificing faith or family, click the link in my bio, join the free group.